This afternoon's session is a continuation of the Fire and Life Safety Seminars, and we have some uh, excellent speakers, just as we did in the first session. And our first speakers are uh, Fang Lee uh, and uh, Jim Mantel from Ralph Jensen Associates. Fang Lee is uh, Vice President for China Operations, and Jim Mantel is uh, in charge of international operations. So please welcome them to the podium. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. We're pleased to uh, have an opportunity to talk to you a little bit this afternoon about a project uh, that our office has been involved in over the past uh, year, and that is the uh, Pearl River Tower uh, in Guangzhou. Uh, the Pearl River Tower uh, is a project that is the uh, uh, global headquarters for the Guangdong uh, Tobacco Company. Uh, it was it is a mixed-use facility, um, primarily uh, office space, corporate uh, office space plus uh, uh, tenant space, uh, but also some assembly occupancies, both on the uh, the lower levels of the building, as well as uh, assembly uh, occupancies at the uh, at the highest level. Uh, the building is 310 meters in height. Uh, and 71 stories, uh, about 170,000 square meters of uh, floor area above grade. And the building was designed by uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill uh, in Chicago. Uh, one of the key kind of outstanding features of this building is it's one of the, one of the first zero energy uh, buildings uh, constructed in China. So it incorporates a lot of uh, innovative and cutting edge uh, energy-related uh, 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 technologies, uh, which were part of, uh, of the uh, issues that we were dealing with. Our fire code compliance approach uh, for projects in, in China uh, is really quite uh, multi-layered. China is a, is a highly regulated um, building environment. They're very sophisticated, very developed uh, building codes and standards, and a, and a very rigorous process uh, for enforcing those codes and standards. So wherever possible on, our, on the projects that we work in, we, we, we seek to try to comply with the, with the Chinese building regulations. Uh, we often find, though, that, that that's not possible in every, in every aspect. Uh, so one of the strategies that we use, and Fong is going to talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but one of the strategies that we use and one of the mechanisms that is in place uh, in China is to use a performance-based uh, design approach uh, for the elements of the building that, that don't strictly comply with uh, Chinese code. The other aspect of that is that the Chinese high-rise code uh, is actually only applicable to buildings up to 250 meters in height. And so technically in China, there is no code for a building more than 250 meters. What this requires is that you have to submit a fire uh, engineering analysis report uh, and have that peer reviewed by an expert panel and ultimately have the expert panel uh, approve uh, the fire engineering design uh, of, of the project. It typically will involve both meeting the, the Chinese high-rise code, but it also uh, often involves uh, providing enhancements to the design that go above and beyond the, uh, the minimum code requirements. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the performance-based design aspects of the project. Uh, and then the other thing that we want to touch on is some of the energy-related uh, technologies and issues. Uh, this was uh, one of the first uh, projects of its type in the area, and so it, it raised a lot of uh, a lot of questions and a lot of issues that we had to work through with the, with the fire service. So with that, I will let Fong talk a little bit about the performance-based design uh, aspects of the project. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like Jim discussed, because of the very nature of this project, uh, with some green building concept, plus the building height significant above the 250 meters, that's caused the challenge to what our approach would be regarding the fire safety. Uh, as Jim mentioned before, there's no 
really written document regarding the perform-based design, even though a lot of pro the project has been done by this, that, that way, starting from the, the called variance approach. With the engineer technology fundamentals, now and nowadays, a uh, lot of more and more engineer tools, such as fair modeling and egress modeling, really make that happen. So we can really look at a building, identify the different individual goals, to achieve the perform base of the building, to make a building safer. Due to the, you know, China's large area and uh, there's no very specific requirement regarding the process of performance based design, this process can be very complicated and time consuming. And uh, because they have some other non code compliant issues such as fair compartment size and the travel distance and the smoke control, control strategy, that's we have to look closely to what we are going to use for this project. Uh, as far as now, Chinese government, the central government and the Ministry of Security Fire Department, they realize that these things must be well documented and uh, therefore the effort is leading and to develop the technical guideline regarding the perform-based design. And uh, RJ is honored to be part of that team to work very closely with the central government agency to develop that document. The perform-based design approach originally came from the, you know, the Western countries uh, such as US, UK, and uh, we use a lot the SIP design guideline, which really specifically describe what the perform based goals and what the criteria will evaluate the achievement. And here, the most important we identified is the tenability parameter, which include visibility, radiation, and temperature, and carbon monoxide. Uh, Sometimes for the large open space, for the toxicity issues, really not very significant, but we have to also to include that in our analysis if that is necessary. Here we show some of the modeling results compared with the, what the scheme would be the, for the design. It, the left side we show a FDS modeling output which shows the atrium which is the uh, very left and the floor area which we identify where we want to put the fire source. For this case, it's the office lobby and uh, some potential fire load would be the, you know, the sofa, some movable furniture, or maybe some special event like Christmas Eve, they have some decoration Christmas trees. So we have to identify different fire scenarios regarding the location and the fire spread rate and the smoke generation rate to come up with different uh, smoke strategy analysis, then we make comparison with the egress model to see if the building is safe for the people to egress. And in this particular case, we have been involving two special uh, can, consideration, one for the atrium separation, one for the regular office space. Now I'm talking about the atrium, because this atrium can, uh, is the office lobby, ground lobby, and some other magazine levels connect to the atrium, some uh, escalator opening also open to the atrium. And what are we going to do? The Chinese fair code, fair compartmentation is very strictly uh, documented in the code. And uh, that based on the occupancy use and also the location of the area we want to look into. For this case, for the regular office space without sprinkler and a detection system, above ground you can only have one thousand square meter as a maximum fire compartment. That means you must have fire walls or fire shutters to totally enclose that, that area so that fire cannot spread even without the active suppression system. But they do recognize with sprinkler and the detection system, that area can be double sized. So that means if we want to comply with the code, the fire compartment size can only be 2,000 square meters. That for our case is totally impossible because this is the open atrium and a few other floors connect to this area. 
And uh, if with fair shutter, it really cannot achieve the architectural goal for this building. The red side shows some of the, our FDS modeling result to see what's the smoke and uh, how that related to people's egress. Now the second case, we really look into the office space, which is a regular office space. It's not related to atrium, but because of the large open office, which is more than 2,000 square meter, the owner doesn't want to put any fire shutters because in the future there may be multiple tenant or single tenant that really cannot make the office building very desirable situation. And therefore, we evaluate what's the floor plan and we want to say if the people's travel egress can be compared with the smoke development. And we, the key for this design is to say a very effective smoke exhaust system. We look at what we have here. We consider about a few considerations, such as we have dedicated smoke exhaust, or we have a combination with normal uh, HVAC system, which for this case, we think much, it's much more desirable because we're talking about a green building concept here. One of the uh, aspects of the design that I mentioned earlier was some of the uh, energy related technologies that had been incorporated into the building. Uh, and as you can well imagine, in a, in a uh, highly regulated environment like, uh, like China, you know, they get out their building codes and look at it and they say, you know, our building codes don't really have wind turbines in them. We don't know what that is. We don't, we don't really understand the technology and this is true of, of a number of the technologies. And of course, the fires are, are fairly rare uh, occurrence in wind turbines, but, but they do happen. There are some documented cases. You know, they're, they're both electrical and mechanical uh, uh, hazards that, that can uh, cause fires. So the, the fire service really raised a, a, a series of issues, both on the you know, regulatory side, uh, the, the code side. You know, these, these things aren't recognized in our codes. How, how do we approve them? Um, the, the particular turbines that we were using are a, a, a European product, so, so even the components were not uh, listed or recognized uh, in China. Uh, and then they had a lot of issues or concerns um, just with the, with the application and the, you know, what happens to these devices in a typhoon? Uh, do these cause vibration to the building that would affect the structure? Uh, if there's a fire in a wind turbine, how do we access it? How do we protect it? Uh, you know, how do, we, uh, how do we fight a fire in that location? So we went through a, a, an exercise of kind of educating ourselves to a great extent on, on these devices, the t these technologies, but also educating the, the fire service. Uh, what we have in the Pearl River Tower is a, a series of wind turbines uh, that occur essentially at the mechanical floors. We have wind turbines at 50, 51, uh, and then at 24, 25 level. These, these are uh, two level mechanical spaces that also happen to be the spaces that, um, that occupy the, uh, the area of refuge floors. So that was a further area of concern. If there's a fire in a wind turbine, what impact could that have on the, on the refuge areas and the refuge floors uh, adjacent to them? Uh, we started to look at the components and the, and the mechanisms and, and how these uh, wind turbines are actually put together and um, prepared a brief for the fire department to look at uh, you know, some of the key considerations for, for these um, uh, devices. The, the, the mechanism itself is uh, virtually all non-combustible material, uh, so there's very little fire load uh, in the turbine itself, in this particular uh, turbine itself. Um, the, uh, the generator device is, is located at the base of the, of the stem, uh, but all the, all the electrical um, uh, equipment associated with this is actually located remotely inside the mechanical room. It's protected uh, per China code. And so they, they felt pretty satisfied that the components and the, the device itself was, uh, uh, was acceptable. So then the issue kind of got into um, protection of the building area, the exterior building area around the device. And we you know, recommended a strategy where you know, we have 
fire rated floors above and below, and then uh, some level of, of uh, fire resistance, although we didn't, we didn't define it as one hour or two hours, but we kind of reinforced the, the fire separation of the exterior wall you know, at the wind turbines. Uh, so uh, that would satisfy their, uh, their concern there. And then finally, they, uh, you know, they wanted to have access to these things uh, in, in, for whatever, you know, to, to be able to fight a fire or uh, you know, whatever other kind of failure mode occurred, they, they wanted to be able to have direct access. Um, and so what we did was uh, actually provided for that uh, through one of, the, uh, one of the exit stairs in, in each case. So they were able to uh, uh, reach and, uh, and access the wind turbines. Uh, the, the second issue that um, came up was the photovoltaic cells, and this is really kind of the same exercise. Um, we had to look at the materials that they're manufactured, the, the, the electrical components and all of those sorts of things, and develop a brief for the fire department on you know, what the components were. Uh, they're all non-combustible and, and, and all of these sorts of things. So um, in this case, the, the wiring and the electrical aspect of it was, uh, was all compliant with the Chinese code. So uh, we were able to, uh, to gain approval of, of this element as well. Uh, and, and the final one um, that was a bit of a sticking issue for a while, but the, the architects actually solved it for us, um, uh, was the whole issue of the double, uh, the double wall, curtain wall, and the spandrel panel. Um, the first part of that is the floor-to-floor -floor separation issue. As you, as you look at these double wall curtain walls, they look an awful lot like atriums, especially when the lowest floor uh, opens to a, an occupied space, as we uh, originally had in this building. Originally, we had the, the double wall uh, uh, three floors, connected three floors, and so, you know, the, uh, even though the codes say, you know, the, the curtain wall begins at the interior face of the curtain wall, uh, these things look an awful lot like atriums. The, the, the deeper they get, the more they look like uh, atrium spaces. So we, we had a couple of go-arounds with the fire department on, on that aspect of it. Um, and then the second, and, and what ultimately happened was the architects decided that they could achieve the same thing by cutting it off at each floor providing the fire separation required by the Chinese code at each floor level and still use, utilize the double, double wall, curtain wall uh, for, um, uh, for energy uh, benefits. Um, China requires a, an 800 millimeter spandrel panel, whether the building is uh, sprinklered or not sprinklered. We were able to incorporate that, that aspect into the design as well. Uh, with, in fact, what happens is that the um, uh, the photovoltaic panels sit in front of the uh, of the fire rated uh, spandrel panel, and that's where those are incorporated into the design. Um, so, in in conclusion, uh, it was a unique project for us. Uh, we we learned a lot about some of these emerging technologies, and I and I suspect as the uh, you know as this green movement continues and the technologies, uh, the innovative technologies continue, um, that we're going to see more and more of these kinds of. Uh, uh, applications in buildings, and uh, we're going to uh, really have to pay attention to some of the fire-related issues. So, thank you. Thank you.